A story of a love that can never be. And a hatred that always was. And now, the most anticipated epic adventure of the year will never come to a theater near you. Final Fantasy VII. Welcome back to a very special Retro Rebound. In today's video, we're finally going back to one of the all-time classics here. Look, we've talked a lot about Final Fantasy on the channel from 10 to 9 to 12. We've done even spin-offs like Dirge of Cerberus, but we've never talked about the GOAT to many. Final Fantasy VII. And with Rebirth shortly upon us, we have our review slash impressions up on the channel now. We just did a big remake retrospective. We have all of that out now. The best way to cap it off is to do a nice retrospective on the entirety of the classic Final Fantasy. Not just because it's a great time to go back, think about it, celebrate it, play it, but also when it comes to classic Final Fantasy and you look at Remake and you look at Rebirth, you know, those games are kind of like sequels more than recreations of what we already knew. And because of all that, I wanted to go through everything from comparing, contrasting, remake slash rebirth to what we get here in the classic games, looking at the gameplay, doing of course a complete box experience with the copy behind us, and naturally going through the story, which we'll save for the latter part in case you're trying to avoid spoilers. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a special Retro Rebound. I hope you're all doing fantastic. And before we begin, a quick word from today's sponsor. The following video is brought to you by Squarespace. We live in the day and age of entrepreneurs, all right? So everyone's got their own side hustle, growing business, million dollar idea that they're looking to pursue. And now you're gonna take the first step to being your own boss. One way you can get your eyes on your brands, your products, your ideas is through a great website, but it's gotta look slick. It's gotta look good. It's gotta look professional. And that's why I'm here to tell you about Squarespace where all of their websites are powered by Fluid Engine, a next generation website design system from Squarespace. So it's never been easier for you just to hop on, pick a template, design your own website, whether it's for custom merch where you're trying to sell a product and you'll just focus on the important stuff to create that passive income stream while Squarespace will handle things like production, inventory, shipping, all the monotonous business stuff. They got that covered for you. There are analytics to help you track your website's growth, the business's growth. So what are you waiting for? It's time to start your own business. It's time to make your own website. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash retro rebound to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So Final Fantasy VII is an interesting game for me because I was born a few years before it came out and I got to it very late. I got to it in 2013. Buddy of mine recommended it to me and said, go ahead and try it because it was a couple bucks on Steam. So I figured why not? And the rest is history. I had actually only played this game one time still to this day, but I think the biggest props I can give to the game is even though I played it once, through a myriad of releases and reviews and other experiences, Final Fantasy VII has always stuck with me. It's not my personal favorite of the bunch. I still absolutely adore Final Fantasy IX, I think, because the theme spoke to me at just the right point in my life. But Final Fantasy VII is a powerful game that has so much staying power through its themes. But for those of you who maybe have thought, I'm too late to Final Fantasy VII, you're not. Look how late I started. And it's still not too late to go back to the classic. And I think if you're interested in remake and rebirth, I've seen some some ads that YouTubers are doing saying like, hey, rebirth is the best starting point. You can play this game and enjoy it without playing remake or the classic. That's a lie. <laughs> That's a complete lie. Please, please at least catch up on what happened in the classic before even considering diving into remake, let alone rebirth. You will be so lost. Anyway, I don't need to go on about what this game did for the industry as it leapt from the SNES to the first 3D Final Fantasy game on PlayStation 1. It's also easily one of the most important video games ever made. While things like its character models are more charming instead of impressive like they may be nowadays, things like pulling the camera down for Cloud and Tifa while they share a more intimate moment outside the ship toward the end of the game, combined with some of the most incredible music in gaming, is what makes it so special. Her saying that words aren't the only way to express one's thoughts before it fades to black and then it fades back in and they're just holding one another in complete silence. It was so well written and uncompromising in its process and it's that which makes Final Fantasy VII still worth playing and still special to this day. Of course, even if you know the most popular spoiler in all of gaming, which we'll talk about later. And if you don't know what it is, don't worry, I'll warn you when we ruin all of that. 
While I compliment the strong grip of character work for both Remake and Rebirth, it's all thanks to how airtight things are in the original game that make it possible and even worth further exploring. Now, when you look at, generally speaking, Final Fantasy VII, you have things that are really expanded upon that you may be familiar with thanks to Remake and in turn Rebirth, like the hooded figures. You'll find them inside houses in Nibelheim, as an example, but in Remake you see them way more, in Rebirth you see them way more. You also have changes like the Fort Condor minigame. It's here in the original, but I think with Intermission, they did a great job touching that one up and making it a lot more accessible and easier to understand. The bike sections are entirely different in how they control and how they feel. It's only been further fine-tuned in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. And the soundtrack, the differences are immense, where I think Remake and Rebirths have a lot of remixes of what you already know and love from the classic, but Final Fantasy VII actually was supposed to have a fully vocalized soundtrack thanks to it being made on a CD-ROM, but it was starting to extend the load times of the game, so they decided to go with what we have today, and look how well that panned out. So it's crazy just to look at all of the differences. And now we're gonna take a look at a complete inbox copy of Final Fantasy VII, and then get into the gameplay and story. Here we are, Final Fantasy VII for the PlayStation 1. This is a greatest hits copy. You know I usually don't roll up this because of the spine, and yeah, it messes up the shelving, but this is my fiance's copy. She picked it up at her first ever PAX East, and naturally there's some sentimental value here. I do not want to replace this, even if I, I can't stand the green here. But nonetheless, great complete box copy here, as you'll see with the manual. But the back of the box will begin with some real iconic shots here. You see Ifrit. You see Genova here. Sorry, it's a little reflective because of all the white in the imagery, but they say it's quite possibly the greatest game ever made, and I imagine if you read the comments, many people will echo that sentiment. An epic adventure across three CD-ROMs, which we'll be showing off in a moment. What begins as a rebellion against an evil corporation becomes much more, and what erupts goes beyond imagination. With vivid landscapes, lush 3D animation and environments, Squaresoft's multi-million dollar masterpiece is like nothing ever before, and it is only on PlayStation, and it still is only on PlayStation, and it towers over the competition in the terms of graphics, sound, story, and playability according to Game Pro. All right, let's take a look at these three CD ROMs. So you'll notice here, uh, no crazy CD art when it comes to Final Fantasy VII, whether it's disc one, two, where I'm showing you three right now. And actually, what is cool is the art behind it. You see Sephiroth, like, this is what's special about this. I know this is greatest hit, so they may have had the opportunity to change some of the art on the inside, but this is a game that I feel like when it released, it knew it was going to be greatness. And you'll see that as we get into the manual here. Like I said, a lot of the images behind the, the discs are one of my favorite parts. But let's take a look at this manual here, which as you'll see on the inside, the opening shot is one of the most memorable ones. It's the opening of the game, it's Midgar, it's the setting for the first Final Fantasy VII remake. But as you go through, you're gonna see the characters. I thought this description was kind of funny. During the game, you will encounter friends and other important characters in the story. However, depending on how you play, you may not be able to befriend some of these characters. And so I, I just thought this was kind of interesting because they introduce everyone from Cloud all the way to Vincent, who were, you know, Yuffie, these are missable characters, right? I like how they portray Sephiroth with a sealed Genoa file here from Shinra. Uh, that all is interesting to me. But yeah, these characters are missable as we'll talk about in a little bit. But they even show here uh, this shot of the Golden Saucer with Kate Sith, some of the event games that you'll be going through. Uh, one thing I'll talk about in a little bit is how what makes Final Fantasy VII so special is how it goes beyond a traditional JRPG, especially for its time. They go through some pretty basic gameplay breakdowns that we all know and love, and this is what I mean by a game knowing its greatness. Like this shot right here, right? Like Sephiroth in the fire in Nibelheim. This is arguably Sephiroth's defining shot, and they just have it here in the manual. It's like they just knew. They just knew, and then you could see the, the banner up top changes to match that so it's fire throughout. You can see Sephiroth in the background, like just really cool touches here. Like they just knew what the moments that fans were going to attach themselves to would be. Uh, as you see here though, they're just breaking down the, the simple things, the limit breaks, the order that you can set your party in, ATB system. You have Yuffie here. I thought this shot was really interesting, right? Yuffie, a missable character. She still has some great moments in the game, especially in Wutai, of course. Uh, but it was interesting to see that she uh, made the cut here with the illustrative work. Some of the machines and vehicles you'd be riding around on. I love this shot here. This is also a really good one. And you get to the back 
with the credits, which is a pretty small list if you want to know how much game development is bloated. Look how small that is. Uh, and that was for one of what's considered the greatest games ever made. I wonder if there's just a company one day that's just going to go back and start making games that look like Final Fantasy VII. Uh, maybe that would be easier to produce. But you'll see here that uh, they have a strategy guide packed into the back here. And actually a fun thing I noticed was right on the, if I can flip the page here. They warn you here uh, with this image of Barrett that uh, they're about to spoil the game here and they encourage you to play it on your own and I just thought this was an interesting perspective because nowadays we get spoiled with games through thumbnails on YouTube so yeah crazy how things have evolved from strategy guides to now we see the the run through of the opening parts of the game to promote the Brady games strategy guide then we have the strategy guide here in full only $15 and then some promotions from Square I always love to see this stuff here you have Bushido Blade Final Fantasy Tactics you have Saga Frontier, like what? They were just cooking back then, man, crazy. And in the back is, of course, the Aerith art. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is a greatest hits copy of Final Fantasy VII. Let's get back to the rest of the game. So the gameplay is tough to expand upon for an extremely long period of time because it's your natural, classic, turn-based action that you know and love from Final Fantasy. What my modern takeaway is now after playing recently Final Fantasy VIII and going through a lot of other Final Fantasy games before that for the first time here on this channel is, I just wonder what happened after seven until we got to 10 where they had great turn-based combat once again. Eight, obviously a lot of its systems collapsed upon itself in my opinion, but nine even doesn't have this snappiness and this fluidity and responsiveness in its combat system that seven just has down so well the way the atb gauge or active time battle gauge flows whose turn it is how everyone's actions are snappy and responsive and you get to the next player who you can control immediately it is turn-based and you can change options in the menu to make it where like once you have a command menu open time will freeze in the battle so if you're kind of nervous and you're playing for the first time and you don't want to move too fast this game does allow you to slow it down, but I will just say that playing it without the weight is awesome because you get to see how all over the controls you are. I mean, it's really active and engaging for a quote turn-based game and it opens up the door for what you see with Remake and eventually Rebirth and how they evolutionize it so much that you have action combat mixed with these ATB gauges. The materia system is equally simple and effective here. You can equip spells and abilities to your weapons, to your armor through those materia slots. I think one of the biggest compliments I can give the game now is very little grinding is required. I think if you wanna set yourself up for success, once you get to Junon, that's where I think you could grind a couple of those Shinra soldier battles, get a ton of XP, and rocket yourself up to the top, and you'll be pretty much good for the entirety of the game. At least that's what I personally did, and it really set me up to chase down like the rest of the summons, the ultimate weapon, and so on and so forth, where I think just a little bit of grinding goes a long way in this game. I remember when I played for the first time, I threw maybe an hour into it, and that was really it, which if you look at other Squaresoft games, it was kind of required, or in the case of Final Fantasy VIII, kind of punishing to grind. One thing that I loved remembering with Final Fantasy VII when messing around with it again for this video was seeing how it was so much more in the JRPG. You look at today with Final Fantasy VII Rebirth and as you play through it, of course there's the Golden Saucer section with a ton of mini games there. And a lot of times that feels very, I'm gonna make up a term here, triple A-ified, right? Like triple A games, never really try to rest on too many other laurels. They're always throwing a ton of things at you at once, whether it be a lot of budget into big cutscenes to sort of wow you away and make you forget about redundant gameplay. Or in the case of Rebirth, it's very arcadey and gamified where they're just throwing a ton of mini games your way. And I thought that was very unique to Rebirth, but it showed to me how forgetful I had been of that middle chunk of the game of Final Fantasy VII and how mini game rich it was, where you have the golden saucer, as I mentioned, you have the bike sections, you have snowboarding, you have chocobo racing, and what it all brings it together to be is something that's far more than a JRPG. Of course, it has the tropes you know and love, leveling up, turn-based combat, great story, engaging characters, but then you look at what surrounds it, and it's all those little mini games, those mini modes that help elevate it further. And you gotta also remember the time period it came out in. It was just good enough to be a turn-based game, so this was really punching above its weight. So there's not much I can say that hasn't already been said with the gameplay in Final Fantasy VII. 
But let's talk about the story here. So we're going to, if you haven't played it yet, spoil Final Fantasy VII. I say that out of respect for people who have yet to finish it because, you know, as someone who tried it out pretty late, you maybe you haven't, but I really do encourage you before you go, please, please play Final Fantasy VII. It is an all-time classic and well worth your time. With that, spoiler modes are on. Okay, let's do this. So much of Final Fantasy VII's themes feel prevalent to this day, in my opinion. It's a tale about corporate greed. It's about how when they're left to run rampant that it can do unimaginable damage to the planet. What you have at the heart of this story is an energy source called Mako, which is responsible for powering literally everything on the planet. They take this resource called Lifestream. When it's processed, Mako is the end result of that. Who's controlling all of this? Shinra. They're this big power electric megacorp. They're handling the dispersion of Mako across the planet. And basically what they're doing is bleeding the planet dry, as Barrett would say, by going for all the Mako. So the game opens up, as we all famously know, with Cloud teaming up with Tifa and Barrett, and they're taking down a reactor. Naturally, as I showed with the back of the box, to strike against an evil corporation. It becomes, again, as the back of the box said, much more than that. You have Sephiroth at the heart of the story as the true main antagonist. So Sephiroth, what he wants to use is this thing called the Black Materia, and it's gonna allow him to summon Meteor, and he's gonna basically nuke the entire planet with that. So it's on your journey that you learn Genova has wiped out the planet many years ago, and that Shinra used the same cells from Genova to create Sephiroth, who Cloud also happens to be like this failed clone of. Oh, and Cloud's memories are also that of Zax, who's the main character that you see in Final Fantasy VII Crisis Core. It's not Cloud's memories in this game, thus further complicating his relationship with Aerith as we see that expand upon in Crisis Core with some of the interactions between Zack and Aerith. It's also on this journey that arguably the most iconic and spoiled death in all of gaming occurs, where Aerith is killed as she prays to the planet, and it turns out that works, but Sephiroth had stopped wholly from being cast on the planet. So the party is forced to face off against Genova, and Sephiroth, where upon winning, Holy is cast and heals the planet. So that is your too long didn't read of the events that happened in Final Fantasy VII. It definitely has a lot more in between, but that is basically the general premise of it. What I noticed when going through all of this was looking at the dramatic shift in pacing. You look at two hours in and you're basically out of Midgar. That's the entirety of Final Fantasy VII Remake, which is upwards of a 40 to 50 hour game, depending on how much time you spent with the side content. You look at seven to eight hours into the game and you're seeing the Nibelheim incident, AKA the beginning of Rebirth, which is crazy to think about that you're in a whole entirely different second game. And I guess maybe you could argue like, well, there's different CD-ROMs as you just saw. So maybe this is the disc two when it comes to Rebirth, which I get, fair enough. Some look at this pacing and they speak to it as a preference. I prefer the snappiness of Final Fantasy VII. I feel like each has their own set of strengths. What I'm gonna try to do here is shine a light on why I think the way Final Fantasy VII handles things works really well, but not really shutting down what Remake and Rebirth do, which I think are equally important actually. With Remake and Rebirth in the mix, Final Fantasy VII does feel more and more like a snapshot view of the events that happened throughout the entirety of this universe. You hang with Avalanche, but only ever so briefly before they're shoveled out of the story. You really don't get to see the impact that Avalanche had on destroying the reactor at the beginning of the game and what Midgar goes through in turn in such an intimate way, which is captured well in the remake. You do get a peek into Nibelheim and learn enough to explore Sephiroth's descent in the madness. Gungaga is but a glimpse of the past, briefly disclosing Zack's history. And thanks to games like Remake, Rebirth, and Crisis Core, these are further expanded upon. Wutai feels so much more important in context thanks to Crisis Core and Intermission, but it's really like a pit stop in the base game. So I think there is so many moments throughout where you get a general good enough idea of things and that brisk pace is what makes the core Final Fantasy VII package great. You get enough context from everyone where you can go 60 hours and have everything you need to know and be happy with that. What Remake and Rebirth do are take those snapshots and blow them up, right? They're like enhancing the image now from 240p to 4K. And they're taking all of the motion capture, added lines of dialogue, and further bringing these scenes to life, but also elevating them. I really do like Remake and Rebirth's stop and smell the roses approach. I think it works really well for the story they're trying to tell here, which seems to be very much one of multiple universes happening. And I think there's something to be said about Final Fantasy VII's 
lack of messing of timelines, it's brisk pace, it allows for a lot more. For example, it makes the largest moments in the story more digestible because what I've noticed with Remake and Rebirth is as I'm taking things in, I'm also trying to comprehend how vast this universe is becoming, how quickly it's happening, the chain of reactions to moments that are happening before me. It can be a lot to take in, plus shoveling in, you know, the occasional mobile character. You really don't have to deal with what could be viewed as that additional fluff in the core game. It also leads to better pacing. As an example, we'll talk about Aerith's death, right? She dies in pretty much the middle of the game. This is a massive plot point, and especially for a JRPG to kill off really your opening party member, that's pretty ballsy to do. And so to do that in the middle of the game, not toward the end of the game, like there's still so much more game left and repercussions because of that action there. Like it's pretty gutsy to go out there and say like, we're going to kill off Aerith, right? So when you look at something like that, that's a mid game plot point versus in Rebirth heading into it. I don't know this by the way, so no spoilers, but heading to Rebirth, it's a question mark. Like, is she going to die? Is that the plan? You know, it's so that is the difference here where it's, paced out a lot differently. Remake, I love it, but there are moments the dungeons are really long and the story loses a bit of its pacing and there are moments that felt a little more filler than actually necessary to the plot itself. So yeah, you lose a lot of that when you head into core Final Fantasy VII. It also lets you familiarize yourselves with characters quicker since optional members like Yuffie don't add a ton to the game in the terms of the main story dialogue. They sort of save it for optional things like the Golden Saucer date as a great example of that but these characters are just so wonderful because then you get to learn about them quicker and get the answers quicker and it gives the game a overall stronger flow. Red 13, you know, learning in Cosmo Canyon where he is actually the last of his kind. The reward you get from diving into optional characters rather than making them a main part of the story. Yuffie's a big part of Final Fantasy VII now, but she really wasn't in the scheme of things originally speaking. But you look back then and you would get these optional moments like, for example, spending extra time with Yuffie to fight the Pagoda Warriors in Wutai, which gave her a level four limit break, or more deeper cuts like Vincent Valentine's backstory and how he largely feels responsible for the events of the main story as he couldn't stop Hojo. And that led to the experimenting on Zack and Cloud. For me, Vincent Valentine, I mean, it's just aesthetic alone. Like this dude is my favorite character in Final Fantasy VII. Like how, how could I not? You guys know my vibe at this point. Like he speaks to all of my sensibilities, traumatic backstory, dark character. He's got the headband, the crazy anime hair, red color scheme, and he's got two guns. Like, how could you not? It's crazy to me that they made Vincent Valentine optional. And that's one of my favorite parts of the game is that these JRPGs are known for like long winded mainline stories. And then you look at Vincent Valentine and this is a character that is so important to the plot and has so many extra moments and he is optional. So yeah, Final Fantasy VII is still fantastic to this day. Still worth the playthrough, still has amazing characters, music, gameplay even. Like, it translates really well even into modern day. So please check it out if you have yet to. It's super worth it. And what's going on right now with Seven Remake and Seven Rebirth is unprecedented. So please check it out. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'll catch you in the next Retro Rebound. Peace out.